Welcome back, students. So after the last couple classes of discussing how many electron atoms work and the spectroscopies associated with that, we now turn our attention to describing the chemical bond. The bond is the central focus of chemistry. It's what makes atoms molecules. And we previously discussed bonds before, and we have skimmed over what exactly we mean when we talk about a bond. And this came up when we talked about molecular vibration and rotation. Um, but now when we have talked about what the electrons are doing in their atoms and in their orbitals around their atoms, we now want to know well, what do they do when we put two atoms together to make a molecule. So in this first part of the talking about bonds, we're going to talk about making a bond and what it's like to bring two atoms together and make a bond and what we mean by that and how we can describe this. Um, so as we've seen for many electron atoms, uh, these solutions are likely going to be uh, hard and mathematically cumbersome. And that is, of course, going to be the case. When you're talking about most diatomic molecules, you have many electron atoms, then you put two atoms together, and now you have many electron molecules, and that's pretty hard to describe. Um, we're going to focus mostly on a qualitative aspect. We'll look a little bit in class, and the book goes into this in a little bit of detail into a quantitative way of trying to talk about bonds. Um, in molecules, but in the lectures, we are mostly going to be focusing on a high level, on a qualitative level. So the learning goals for this first section here are going to be explain using our quantum mechanics why it's energetically beneficial for atoms to form bonds um, and, and what kind of bonds that they form. We're going to look at some more approximations that we use to estimate molecular wave functions. Uh, and the chief one of those is going to be the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So you're going to want to be able to uh, understand that and defend its use. And we're going to see, and we probably will uh, continue to see this on the next lecture as well, we're going to conceptually, qualitatively combine our atomic orbitals, our S and P and D orbitals, into molecular orbitals. For now, we're going to be considering diatomic molecules, but in the future we'll move on to polyatomic molecules and we'll talk about hybridization and VSEPR theory and so forth. So the first question that we want to ask, and we know the answer to this as chemists, we want to ask what a bond is. And you know that a bond is a shared pair of electrons. So what we're going to be doing in this section is to investigate what this shared pair of electron is, what this bond is in terms of quantum mechanics. Um, so we're going to ask questions like, why do atoms form bonds? And the answer for these kinds of questions of why does something happen in chemistry always boils down to this process, in this case bonding, happens because the bonding is lower in energy. So a bond is lower in energy than two separate atoms. Um, and that is going to mean for us that bonded atoms are held together relatively strongly, but it turns out that they're held together much weaker than uh, electrons are held to the nucleus. So we can address, you know, what the stability of a hydrogen atom is, and we can find out that, uh, so a hydrogen atom, uh, and in this case actually two hydrogen atoms, so two hydrogen atoms are more stable than two electrons and two protons separated from each other, by 2,624 kilojoules per mole worth of energy. And a hydrogen molecule is about 436 kilojoules per mole more stable than two hydrogen atoms. So the bond is strong, but it's not anywhere near as strong as the atoms themselves. So the total energy of a hydrogen molecule, an H2 molecule, is about 83% uh, due to just the hydrogen atoms. And the bond gives a little bit of additional stability. Now, our example here in this first section is going to be considered the simplest molecule that we can, and that will be H2+. This is going to be uh, two uh, nuclei and an electron, so two protons and one electron. We'll ask the same question that we have before, and that's going to be, how can we describe the energy of this molecule? And it, this is akin to describing the Schrodinger equation. So the kinds of things that are going to affect the energy of this molecule are as follows. We are going to have 
the kinetic energy of the electron, the single electron, the kinetic energy of the nuclei. We're also going to have Coulombic attraction between the electron and both nuclei and a Coulombic repulsion between the nuclei. If we had more electrons, uh, for example, an H2 molecule rather than H2 plus ion, uh, we would also have repulsion between the electrons as well. And what can we do with all of this? What we're going to try to do is formulate a Schrodinger equation that we can then solve. And when we'll do this, we'll have our wave function that is now a function of the electron. So our lowercase r here are the coordinates of the electron, and the uppercase coordinates are now the coordinates of the nuclei. And we didn't consider the nuclei before because we set that nucleus to have a 0, 0, 0 uh, components, and there was only one, so we didn't need to describe its motion because it wasn't moving relative to anything else. Now we have two nuclei that move relative to each other, so we have to discuss their coordinates. To make this solution somewhat simpler, we're going to apply the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So this approximation hinges on the fact that atomic nuclei are much heavier than electrons, and about 2,000 times heavier, and that's even just for the hydrogen nucleus. And what that means is that these, the motion of the nuclei can be decoupled from the motions of the electron. And this allows us to split up the wave function into a wave function based on the electron. And so here that's called a BO for Born-Oppenheimer wave function. And then there is a nuclear uh, function here that's based on the motion of the nuclei. So in this case, our Born-Oppenheimer wave function, our electronic wave function, we'll talk about what the electrons are doing, while the nuclear wave function discusses what the nuclei are doing. The nuclei are, of course, doing things. They are vibrating, they're rotating. Um, and this is an important part of the total energy of the molecule. But in this section, we are only really interested in what the electrons are doing. We're gonna to try to make some claims about MO theory and so forth. So we're going to ignore the motions of the nucleus. So the total energy for a diatomic molecule can be described uh, like this. We have this first term here, which is talking about the kinetic energy of the electrons. We have this second term that is the attraction between, uh, here in this case, it's the electrons and nucleus A, the electrons and nucleus B. And this third term here is the repulsion of all the electrons, uh, electron one with electrons two through N, and then we'll go through two and do uh, three through N and so forth. And then we finally have this term, which is the repulsion between the nuclei. So with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, what we do is we pull out this term here, which we treat as constant. Well, the reason we treat this as constant is because we're saying that the nuclei are not moving with respect to electrons. This gives us an electronic total energy operator only dependent on the electrons, and we have pulled out this term here that is a constant as everything in here is a constant if the nuclei don't move. Um, and then we can always come back and find the total energy by evaluating the electronic energy that comes from solving the second equation here. Uh, and then we can go through and just add in this term that is all made up of constants. You can think of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation here as providing a snapshot of the energy of a molecule. In this case, we have ignored nuclear motion, again, because it's so much slower than the electronic motion that we can solve for the electronic motion at every nuclear position. However, the nuclei do move. I mentioned this before, it talks about vibration and rotation. So to get a complete view of the wave function, what we would need to do is solve this equation for every valid set of nuclear coordinates. And that's what programs like Gaussian are attempting to do in order to figure out what things like the bond length uh, and the, the lowest energy of certain molecules are. To get expressions for molecular orbitals, we will simply take what's called linear combinations of atomic orbitals. Uh, this can be done mathematically, and we'll go in some detail how we can do this in class. The math is quite cumbersome for us as chemists, and our focus is typically going to be on taking these combinations qualitatively, and that's very easy to do. 
Uh, essentially, what we do when we go over this with a qualitative approach is add or subtract the orbitals together. So here, imagine that we have a 1s orbital from a hydrogen atom, and we add directly to it another 1s orbital from another hydrogen atom. Now, what would this look like? Well, in this region in between here, we have overlap. So right in between these nuclei where these two orbitals overlap, we would expect the electron to be there more often than not. And you can actually do this mathematically. We'll do a little bit of this in class, but we can also do it very, very qualitatively and say, well, what this shape would look like is a new oblong here molecular orbital. Let me try to draw that again a little bit more circular on the outside. So we'll have this pill-shaped molecular orbital uh, where we have these two nuclei and our electrons actually fairly likely to be in this region in between. Now, another thing we could do, let me copy this here, is subtract these two orbitals. So instead of adding these together, we could subtract them. And in fact, we actually have to do both. And that's what it means to take a linear combination. So now let's imagine that this whole uh, second uh, uh, H1s orbital here is of the opposite sign. So it's not positive, but it's negative. Now what happens in this overlap region? Well, now we actually have positive density and negative density interfering with each other. So when we add these two things together, again, very qualitatively, we actually get a node where our electron is not existing in between the nuclei. Um, and we can see this node, we can draw this node like this, again, in a very qualitative fashion. I'll go ahead and give this a slash to represent a different sign. Um, and this orbital is going to be less stable than this one. So here we have a bonding orbital, and here we have an antibonding uh, orbital. We can think about what's happening in a bond by using our particle in the box model. So thinking back to the particle in a box, how does the box length affect energy? So maybe you still have this equation memorized. Maybe you've already forgot it. We haven't talked about the particle in a box for a few weeks. But the energy levels of the particle in the box are h squared n squared over 8ma squared, what a is the length of the box. So if a particle is in a larger box, that means the energy is lower. And this is in general true for molecules as well. So bringing uh, another uh, proton towards a hydrogen atom now gives that electron more space to move. It can go between both atoms there, which gives it a lower energy in general to form a bond. So again, very general things. We can see how our particle in the box model helps us out. So now what do we do for the bond? Well, what we're going to do is approximate our new molecular orbital that we're going to form as follows. We're going to say that we have uh, some wave function that's equal to uh, Ca times Ca plus Cb times Vb. What are these? Well, these are simply the 1s orbitals around hydrogen atom A and hydrogen atom B. And then there are Ca and Cb, which are normalization constants that say how much the wave function looks like the 1s orbital around uh, atom A and the 1s orbital around atom B. Then what we do is we can evaluate the expectation value. So all we can get is the expectation value because our wave functions are only approximate solutions. We can't get exact energies, but we can get the average energy. So what is the average energy? To evaluate this, we are going to go to the board. So our expectation value is just like it has been in the past. It's simply our wave function operated on by our operator, in this case, the electronic total energy operator, and then multiplied by the complex conjugate of our wave function. To ensure our wave function is normalized, we just normalize it here in the denominator. So what do we get when we actually apply this? So our wave function, like we mentioned before, is shown here. It is some wave function, that's the 1s orbital for hydrogen atom A, and then the wave function for hydrogen atom B. So what happens if we plug this in? Well, let's go ahead and do it. So what we'll get is uh, looks kind of nasty. So our expectation value for energy is going to be equal to the integral of Ca Ba plus Cb Cb star, the complex conjugate of that, and then our electronic total energy operator 
of C A B A plus C B C B. And the tau here, I think we've seen this before, is simply whatever the appropriate barriers of, or, or uh, dimensions of integration are. And then in the denominator, we'll simply have uh, C A B A star plus C B C B. I'll take the star out actually. Uh, so C A B A plus C B C B C B star, and then C A B A plus C B C B integrating over the appropriate uh, dimensions. So what is this here? We can do some simplifications and we'll also take some of these complex integrals and just slap labels on them so we don't have to keep writing them out. So in the numerator, we're going to turn our numerator here, we're like this here, so numerator. This will turn into the sum of four integrals. Um, we are going to have integrals uh, that are fol as follows. So we'll have the integral that is C A star C A star times the electronic energy operator operating on C A C A. Uh, and then we'll have the same sort of thing, but we'll change the labels around here. So we'll have four integrals that look like this, but the A's and B's will be different. So we'll also have an integral that is the same except for it is b's instead of a's. So we'll have cb, uh, phoebe, uh, both stars, and then the total energy operator on cb and phoebe. We'll also have one, uh, or two rather, that are the opposite. ca, phoebe times cb, phoebe, and then we'll have the opposite here, cb, phoebe times ca, phoebe. Oops. So in this case, we have this integral and, and what do we do with it? Well, we recognize that the CB and uh, or the, the, the phi B and the phi A orbitals are very similar, except for they are, are different. They're gonna be separated by space. So they're not the same, but they're kind of, they're, they are in some respects the same, right? The total energy of the 1s orbital for hydrogen A is the same as the total energy of 1s orbital for hydrogen B um, and so forth. So what we'll get when we do this um, is that these two terms in the bottom are the same. Um, and it turns out that we'll also be able to say that the terms in the top are the same. And this is of course only the case because we have a diatomic hydrogen atom. But what we can do is then abbreviate this whole mess as follows. We'll call this here HBB because this first one is B and the second one is B. Uh, this one would then be HAA, this would be HAB, and this is HBA. And we're recognizing that these two are going to be the same. And these two, we can also at some point recognize, will be the same. Um, and what that gets us then uh, is the following. So our numerator, that horrible integral is simplified down into CA squared, and this is technically the magnitude of CA squared in case it's imaginary, times HAA plus CB squared times HBB plus two CA CB times HAB because these two terms are the same here and they have both have a CA and a CB term. So our numerator, so this, this uh, numerator here is the same as this numerator here. It just is a little bit easier to look at. Uh, and we're not really gonna be evaluating these integrals. So these integrals are not gonna be things I expect you to take. We're just gonna be talking about what we can do with them. Now, the denominator uh, goes by a similar uh, path here. So our denominator, we get four integrals again, um, but two of them are even easier. So in the denominator, we get the following. Uh, because we don't have that total energy operator there that's operating on these things, uh, we end up getting uh, the integral of C A star C A times C A, oops, C A V A. And then we get the integral of C B star V B, 
CBBB. And then we get the, well, the opposites, right? So we get CA star, VA star, and these should all be star too, sorry about that, times CBVB, and then we get CB star, VB star, CA, VA. So what we can notice now is that these first two can be rewritten as CA squared times the integral of phi star A, phi A d tau. And remember this phi A is just the 1s uh, orbital for the hydrogen atom around electron A, and that is normalized. So this whole integral here is simply equal to CA squared. <coughs> <clears throat> Likewise, the second integral is CB squared. Now, we can't do the same thing here for these two integrals. And we can't do that because the coordinates are different. So phi A and phi B are very similar, but they are shifted in space, such that we can't say that the integral of phi A star phi B is equal to one, that's not the case. And so instead what we do is say that this is equal to S A B. Here we do S B A and we again recognize that these two are equal. And here our S A B is the overlap integral between A and B. Again, this is not an integral that we solve, it's just something that we take into account. And this overlap integral talks about how well the orbitals of atom A and atom B overlap. Of course, the better they overlap, the stronger the bond will be. And so that means that our denominator becomes CA squared plus CB squared plus 2 CA, CB, SAB, where SAB is this overlap integral. So we can put all that together to get an expression for what the expectation value is for energy. And we get that the expectation value for energy is uh, this numerator here divided by this denominator here. And this may not look much simpler to you, but we are going to make it much simpler. And we're going to do that by recognizing a couple of things. So we'll go through some of the math behind this in class. I'll try to go over it in as least horrible detail as we possibly can. But what we will recognize is that for the hydrogen atom, um, HAA and HABB are going to be the same thing, right? Because we have the same kind of atoms here. We're also going to recognize that we have two options. We have an option where our CA is equal to CB, and this is going to be a bonding option. And we have another option where CA is equal to negative CB, and this is an anti-bonding option. So we have these two options, and in general, this is what we get when we mix orbitals together. That's what it means to take a linear combination of things. If we're taking a linear combination of two atomic orbitals, one from hydrogen A and one from hydrogen B, we will necessarily get two atomic orbitals, or two molecular orbitals, sorry, that go around with that. So we'll have two molecular orbitals, and it turns out that one is this bonding orbital, and the second is an anti-bonding orbital. And what will happen to these? Well, we can calculate their energy. We'll go through this in class. And what we get is that we can get even simpler uh, answers here. So our energy one ends up equaling, on average, HAA plus HAB divided by one plus SAB, the overlap integral. And this corresponds to our bonding case. We can have our anti-bonding orbital that has a different energy. And the antibonding orbital has an energy two that's equal to HAA minus HAB over one minus SAB. So we'll go through some of this math in class. Now, what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that we have two energy levels that are different and they're shifted. So in this case, we are adding this HAB value to our HAA, where here we're subtracting it. Now, what are these numbers? These are 
the energy for the hydrogen atom. So we'll see that HAA, right? HAA is equal to the energy of the hydrogen atom. And there's a little modification term that goes along with it. But essentially, this HAA is approximately the energy of the 1s orbital. Now, that is a, uh, a negative number. And the HAB is also a negative number. And remember, in chemistry, we talk about negatives because the lower is good. So a lower number is more stable. So these both of these H integrals here are negative numbers. So in this case, when we add them together, we're adding two negative numbers together that get lower than the standard. So what we can do, and you've seen things like this before, is if we have our energy for 1s uh, orbital of hydrogen A and 1s orbital for hydrogen B, we, when we make a molecular orbital, we kind of draw these dotted lines down and have a lower energy. So here, this is the energy associated with state one, this bonding orbital. Now, what about state two? Well, in this case, we are subtracting this negative integral from our HAA. So that means we're adding this number and making it more positive than the standard uh, energy of the 1s orbital. In addition, what we're doing is we're dividing by one minus SAB, whereas here we're dividing by one plus SAB. This SAB is an overlap integral. It talks about the overlap that two atoms have, and this is, uh, a fraction between essentially zero and one. If it was one, they'd be the exact same orbital in the exact same spot. If it's zero, they have nothing to do with each other. So this is in general a small fraction. And that means that we're dividing here this number, this HAA minus HAB, by a number less than one. So let's imagine just for a, an example that SAB is equal to 0 0.3. And this side, we're dividing our energy by 0 0.7, while here we're dividing by 1.3. This dividing by a fraction is gonna make this energy larger than uh, our energy one. So we don't see a symmetrical increase for energy two. In fact, what we see is an asymmetrical increase where this antibonding orbital is less stable, is higher in energy than the bonding orbital is. So hopefully you can see that on my crude drawing here, but this distance, this antibonding orbital is much uh, less stable. It's higher in energy than the bonding orbital is lower in energy. And that is a direct consequence of the quantum mechanical mathematics here. To finish off here, we're going to look at the simplest molecule we can, which again is H2+, plus, two protons and one electron. Our conventions for making molecules in chemistry are that the energy is zero when the atoms are, or anything that's making an interaction, is infinitely separated and reaches a stable minimum during the interaction. The fact that we're reaching a minimum here will imply a stable bond. The internuclear distance at this minimum corresponds to the equilibrium bond length. So here we can imagine a hydrogen atom and a bare proton. As we bring them closer together, eventually what happens is that the electron in the single hydrogen atom is able to spread out over both hydrogen atoms. Um, here we can see the potentials kind of merging together to make a much more complicated looking potential. Uh, but the wave functions, as we can see, are basically two 1s wave functions added on top of each other. And we see an enrichment in the region between the nuclei, uh, also known as a bond. We can model this by simply adding a zeta parameter, which is serving the same function as our effective nuclear charge. Um, and this term, what this is doing is allowing the size of the orbital to change as a function of bond formation. So you can imagine that an electron in a hydrogen molecule might feel a greater than one nuclear charge at certain points because it's influenced both by both nuclei. And so we can figure out what this zeta is, and that tells us an information about the size of the orbital, if the electron's held tighter or looser. To take the appropriate linear combinations of two hydrogen atom orbitals, we need to add and subtract them in equal amounts. Um, and we can show this mathematically, but we can also do this very qualitatively, which says that our, our magnitude of the normalization constant, Ca and Cb that we talked about before, must be the same and also have the same sign or the opposite sign. If they have the same sign, we're merging these two orbitals together uh, in a, a way that 
adds their electron density. If we subtract them, um, we'll see that it's kind of the opposite and we are, are removing density. We're having constructive and destructive interference. Um, and we have two functions that look like this. We've changed the A and B to G and U. These letters are representing certain symmetry operations. So uh, the G there talks about what's called, and it's German, it's Gerard symmetry, which means we have an even function where if we take a point psi negative X, negative Y, negative Z, that has the exact same value as the point psi X, Y, and Z. Um, the U is an Ungerard uh, symmetry, and it's an odd function, where psi of negative x, negative y, negative z is equal to negative psi x, y, and z. And we can see what these orbitals would look like. So a, a Gerard orbital here, G uh, bonding orbital, would look like this. And we can see that there's electron density between the bonds. And here, our Ungerard orbital has no electron density between the bonds. Um, these G and U labels, again, they, they are not talking about bonding and antibonding. They are talking about symmetry. So we'll see next time when we start looking at pi uh, molecular orbitals that the labels actually switch. So the G and U, again, always talk about symmetry, um, which is not necessarily the same thing as bonding. For these types of bonds, which we'll call sigma bonds, and we'll see that in more detail next time, uh, the G is representing the bonding orbital and the U is the antibonding orbital. So where we'll go next time is to apply this in a little bit more detail to a little bit more types of bonds, and we'll look at more homonuclear diatomic molecules that aren't the H2 plus molecule. So starting with H2 and then moving on to other things like N2O2 and so forth.